Everybody, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I'm Rachel Young and I'm with M Agency. I'm here with my co-host, uh, Rachel O'Donnell. So we're here facilitating the webinar today. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Walt to kick us off. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Walt Birdsall and I work for the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department in a program called Natural Yard Care. And what we do is we partner with the city of Gig Harbor and the partner with, and uh, University Place to offer these webinars. Usually, of course, we do this uh, in person, but this is a really nice alternative for this time that we're going through right now. And uh, the reason we do this is because we're encouraging people to use less chemicals on their yard, less chemical pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers, because during our rainy time, which is coming up here real soon, uh, that washes down into the streams, down into what we call the surface water and down into the street and maybe down into the, the storm drain. And it ends up in our waterways and our streams, uh, lakes, Puget Sound, and even filters sometimes into the groundwater and the water we drink. So we're just going to uh, encourage you to less, use less chemicals. And we brought on a great speaker tonight to uh, talk about that. But before we introduce him, I would like to introduce to you uh, Bree Ellis at, from the City of Gig Harbor and uh, Todd Smith from University Place. So Bree, could you say a few words and then maybe Todd, if you would. Sure. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Bree Ellis. I work for the City of Gig Harbor. I'm a stormwater engineering technician um, and I manage our municipal permit that we have through the state um, that Department of Ecology has graciously given us. Um, and we're excited to have Walt here and join him on the Natural Yard Care. Todd Smith, I'm the storm coordinator for the City of University Place and uh, do many different things for University Place, but uh, tonight we're here for the uh, natural yard care. There's some education outreach opportunities to have and uh, Lad has some really good information for us tonight. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Walt. Thank you. Okay, I just wanted to then now, I, right now, uh, introduce to you Lad Smith, our speaker tonight. And uh, Lad is, of course, going to be speaking on work less and have a better looking yard or garden. And uh, I can tell you that it's attractive for me because anytime you can work less and get something to look better, that's awesome. <laughs> so and he has a lot of great ideas. Uh, Lad's worked in the uh, landscaping business for many, many years, and he has been our speaker a few years back, and I know he's very uh, entertaining and educational. So thank you, Lad, and take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Walt. And thanks, everyone, for coming in tonight. And I especially want to thank Rachel and Rachel for putting all this together, um, along with Walt. I mean, it's a lot of effort. You might think that all they have to do is just hire pretty faces to do the talks, but there's a lot more involved. And so uh, I really appreciate them um, putting all the effort into it. So, okay, so we are going to share screen, get this puppy rolling right now. Okay, slideshow from beginning. Okay, woo, off and running. That was the hard part right there. Okay, so like Walt said, um, uh, you know, the more time that we can spend enjoying our yards, the better. And this is a picture of my place, uh, and I'll show you some more photos of my yard, how I've, I'll inter how I've incorporated all these techniques that I'm going to talk to you about tonight, how I do my yard, because really this is my favorite place in my yard where if I just want to be in my yard. I just want to like be a part of it instead of like a lot of times we're always just working, working, working because there's always something going on and seems like there's always maintenance going on. So I want to teach you some things tonight to make your yard more successful, which means it makes it so it's easier to care for. It really is, which means that you can spend more time in your favorite spot. And um, a quick story, I uh, have a couple of garden designers that we work with and one of them has a good friend uh, from England and they were visiting some gardens around here in the Pacific Northwest and the, the designer from England, she said, all you Americans have benches in your yards, but you never sit in them. And it's kind of true because it's like, we're just always busy, busy, busy in our yards. And so what I want to talk to you about tonight is things to make your yard easier to work with. Um, and so you have times to sit in your bench or lay in your hammock like this, okay? So for a lot of people, this is no maintenance, right? I mean, it's just like, you just don't do nothing. And really, 
<clears throat> you know, we're, we're stewards of this little planet and it doesn't matter what piece of property we are on, we're not gonna be there forever. So we really need to take care of it in an environmental and in a correct way so that it just lasts and gets better and better and better. So instead of just like letting mother nature do her thing, what we try to do is work with her to create beautiful gardens. And it doesn't matter if it's like a woodland garden that shows here on the left hand side, um, uh, more naturalistic, you know, or even the one on the right hand, which is a, a little more ornamental, we say, you know, where it has more, um, uh, or more, more ornamental plants and maybe a little more care and stuff. The whole key is to build beautiful gardens by having really nice soil so that they just kind of, instead of surviving, they're thriving and they're exploding, taking up space, which means that we have less care going on. And the beauty about building these kind of gardens too is that we bring in all the beneficials that we want. We're gonna bring in wildlife, you're gonna bring in birds, um, you're gonna bring in butterflies, you're gonna see hummingbirds all over, you're gonna see all the bees and pollinators because they come to these types of yards that we're trying to create. So as long as we just start putting out the things that they're attracted to, you will see all those things in your yard too. It just makes our landscape and our, our gardens even better by having all this interaction with these kind of creatures and stuff too. So, so tonight, what I'm gonna to talk to you about, the four things, healthy soils, it's a whole key. And I think if anybody was here last week for bills and stuff like that, it's probably this reoccurring theme of just like, soils are the whole key, soils are the whole key. And if we're constantly gardening to improve soils, then our plants um, are better because of it. So that's what I try to do in all my, all my gardening is I'm trying to make my soils better and then my plants explode. And I'll talk to you about mulching, which is really Mother Nature's easiest way to get soils better quicker is to mulch and to add this renewal, this, um, uh, this consistent renewal of organic matter, which is how Mother Nature works. I'll talk a little bit about right plant, right place, and then I'll talk about smart watering. And really soils, plant, watering, if we can do all those three things, our plant landscapes explode and they are so much easier to take care of. So, whoops, already throwing stuff around. So part of the program tonight will be based on, it really is based on the Natural Yard Care Program. And um, Walt says we'll have some links for you, so I got to the publication. Um, because really the whole, the whole key again is, first step of Natural Yard Care is healthy soils. Second is right plant, right place. Third is smart watering. Fourth is thinking twice before using any pesticides. And really if we're doing the top three things, pesticides should be, a last, last resort. It should never be something we're doing on a regular basis. And some, most times we can eliminate any of those things going into our landscapes or into the environment. Um, and then the number five one is um, natural lawn care, which is a whole subject in Excel. But the natural yard care program is what this is based on. And the other publication, Growing Healthy Soils, that we'll give you the link for, has some fantastic information again about soils and the why, they're, why they're so important and even more information about you about taking care of soils, okay? But really soils are the whole key, okay? They're mother nature's true difference maker when we're doing it right. Um, and there's, I, I wanna reference a couple of things before I kind of talk about soils, but uh, in uh, um, a couple of years ago, the Seattle Times referenced this work that WSU did about water quality. They took three tanks, 12 salmon, and what they did is they filled one tank with just really nice, pristine well water, okay, just fresh water. One uh, tank they filled up with storm water runoff from Highway 520. And this is before Highway 520 has been rebuilt, where now instead of that water going straight down into Lake Washington, they actually collect the water from that uh, whole deck, move it off into um, the side where they run it through some. Uh, uh, soils and some estuaries and stuff like that in order to cleanse the water before it goes back into Lake Washington. But this before that. So they had straight water from Highway 520 and that's what they were trying to study. And then the third tank, they had the same storm water runoff from Highway 520, but they ran that water through a small layer of gravel and compost before it went into the barrel. And then they put the fish into the barrel. And what they found every time they did the study is that the fish that were in the well water, straight, really nice water, just swimming around, having a good time. The fish that went into the water that was stormwater runoff from Highway 520, not being treated, just straight going down into the, uh, into the lake. Soon as those fish went into the water, almost immediately turn upside down, float. I mean, that kind of an impact by having that kind of material being flowed down into Lake Washington. And that third barrel where they had 
um, that stormwater runoff run through a small layer of gravel and compost and then put into that barrel, all the fish survived in that. So healthy soils in very, very small increments are environmental benefits, okay? And that's the beauty of this is that we can have small uh, uh, benefits with a little bit of healthy soil and it gets better and better and better over time. And that's why it's so important to be focused on our soil health and our soil building to be able to have better soils because this can be an immediate result. As soon as water hits this kind of a soil, it allows it to slow down, it allows it to spread out, and then allows it to sink in. And if this water with any kind of contaminants can go through healthy soils, then it's gonna be really nice water once it gets down on the groundwater. So healthy soils can make a huge difference on just water quality. So have a better landscape and have a better environmental benefit just by taking care of our soils, okay? And then there's this article that was in Atlantic Magazine several years ago, where now they have discovered the soil bacterium that what they found is that when we have our hands like this one down below in really good soil, nice, dark, rich, healthy, just it smells good, it feels good, and you just know there's so much life in it. Just by having our hands in that soil for 20 minutes releases serotonin. So just by gardening, just by being in healthy soils, we feel better. So healthy soils also make us better too. It makes the environment better. It makes it better for the fish. Everything we do makes better with healthy soils. So good gardening and just having your hands in good soils makes us better people. So soils in themselves have all these benefits, including plants love growing in it, okay? So this is like the ultimate in healthy soils right here, right? This is like in the whole river uh, rainforest over there. Look at the size of some of those trees, you know, dug firs and hemlocks and, uh, um, and, and lower story trees like um, dogwoods and vine maples. And then you have the bottom where you have slough and ferns and moss growing everywhere and stuff like that. And this is soil that has been built up over many, many millennia in order to build up these beautiful soils to get this kind of plant growth, which is really an ultimate sustainable system. Nothing gets inputted in here, nothing gets taken out of, it just generates its own food and everything it needs by just having everything that comes out of the sky um, plant-wise, so you're talking cones and leaves and needles and even old branches and trees, whatever it is, always fall into the ground and then Mother Nature's beautiful soils underneath it turning into better and better soil. And that's how you soil build. But this is usually built over uh, a long time, like you said, um, when we're talking this kind of a forest. And so in this kind of a forest, you'd actually have this huge soil can or tree canopy up here, and then an under canopy, right? And then you have this thick layer of organic matter that's just everything is coming down, just continually build up on top of each other. And so the topsoil underneath is built over time. And all that's based on beautiful soil organisms like these guys, which gives us, um, uh, which gives us the ability to break down that organic matter and make beautiful soil. So all this is rich in bacteria and funguses and protozoas and everything to make soils nice. And then you have your subsoil. And then if the water can come down and penetrate through that, it gets into become groundwater. And again, with beautiful subsoil, I mean topsoils, it's all that water is cleansed and goes into the groundwater as pure water. So in Mother Nature's <clears throat> system, the water is slowed down through this canopy of all these plants. So it slowly moves down so that when it hits this organic matter, it's allowed to slowly spread out and then slowly go into the topsoil. Um, so 50% of it, like it shows here, might just be evapotranspiration, which is the water that goes down into the soil, taken up through the roots, and then taken up back through the plant, and then out through the leaves. And then 35% there is detained and then down and allowed to be infiltrated into um, the topsoil and down through the subsoil in the groundwater. And then there might be just a little bit of surface water runoff, which usually just happens when the, the water just coming out of the sky so fast that it just doesn't have enough time to percolate down. Um, but in the, this kind of system, it's usually more of a rare occurrence that those kind of waters happen just because of all this structure set up to detain and let water move in, okay? But the challenge is, especially when we get into our urban development, is that we take away all those good soils. Look at this. I mean, we're talking like feet and feet of beautiful, dark, rich, phenomenal soil that's been built up over all this time, and they haul it away because you can't build on top of that. You got to get down to that subsoil. But what they do is they haul it away, and then they sell it because it's beautiful soils that has tremendous value in it, but you can't build on it, okay? 
Then we build utopia, like, ah, here it is, you know. Um, more, we got houses, more roofs, more sidewalks, more driveways, more streets. They don't bring all that topsoil back. They don't bring another four feet of topsoil and like pile it up around our houses. It just doesn't work that way, right? They might bring in a little skip of some topsoil, roll out some lawn, throw in a couple plants and say, here's your new home, good luck with it. S plants are always gonna struggle this environment, okay? So now what we've created is in this urban environment is not much of a canopy anymore. All those trees are taken away. So we have very little then being evapotranspirated until we start building up larger trees again. We have very little then being detained or allowed to infiltrate because we don't have organic matter on this, uh, of this topsoil and very little topsoil and then a huge amount of subsoil. So now most of the water that comes to our urban environment is stormwater runoff. That is all the water that just is being run off onto all these hard surfaces down into the lowest body of water. And again, a whole key is that right over here, our soils are very poor. They don't have all that, all that life in them that the, the true forest and everything have on a sustainable system to be able to make soils better, okay? So we're almost again at starting over from scratch in mother nature's world, okay? So because of this, we've, we've actually created two extremes in our urban environment, which is challenging for plant material. And then when plants are challenged and they're not growing well, that's when we as, wanting to make things better we're thinking oh my gosh i got to do something out there i got to throw more chemicals out there if i got more weeds i got to throw more weed killers out there i might have more bugs i think i got put more bug killers out there and stuff like that because the plants aren't doing well the reason the plants aren't doing well is because of the soil system they're growing it in they're not doing not doing well because of an insect or disease that's usually a secondary um uh, sign that something's going wrong underneath the soil and that's what we have to do because we've created these uh, two extremes so the first one, like one reason why we're all here tonight is the stormwater runoff, right? Because now we're seeing that this water that comes from the sky, which two thirds of the planet, if they figure by 2040 is not gonna have access to fresh water. And for us in the Pacific Northwest, it's like, it's a problem, we got too much water. You know what I mean? But it's too much, it's a problem in our urban environment. Fresh, beautiful water is what everyone wants, okay? But here's one of them. In 2014 to 2017, we set a new record of, um, of uh, 186 inches of rain coming down. And you can see again, where we're seeing huge spikes in our winter months. Usually we're seeing a lot more water coming down than we usually have seen in the past. But it also, and I'll talk about this as the second extreme, we're seeing less water in the summer times um, corresponding. So more water winter for stormwater runoff, less water doing or during our summer months, okay? And just so everybody were on the same page, our stormwater system is set up in our urban environments to just move water away from our urban environment, okay? So most of our urban environments, unless you're on a septic system, has a sewer system, right? And that's where all the water runs from our homes and our um, uh, bathrooms and our kitchens and everything like that, runs down to the sewer system. They clean up all that water, put it back out in the environment after they treated it. But our stormwater systems are actually just huge culverts underneath the ground that allows it to catch water and just move it to the lowest body of water. It's just moving water around. There's no treatment going on. There's no cleansing of this water. It's just moving water away. So when this happens, it also just moves everything that's being collected with this water into those lowest bodies of water. Whoop, uh oh, went a little too fast. And this is usually what we see, like, like I just saw again, um, we had some dry, you know, a couple dry months. Um, we get a good couple, a couple of rain, and then you see all the oils from the streets, all the grit, all the grime, everything that's just been collecting there. And now we see all these rainbows of all this stuff going down, right down into the stormwater systems um, from just our car driving and stuff. Um, and we're seeing more, more roads, more cars. I mean, that's something that we're just kind of something we're not getting away from. It's just kind of always building out with more impervious surface instead of pervious surface, and it's causing a bigger problem. And Walt even mentioned the pesticides, and that's what we're really finding a lot too in all of our rivers and streams and lakes and tributaries, anything that where water runs through and we're all on a watershed. Even if you can't see water where you look out your window, we are all above water, usually the water's moving down. But here's a report that the USGS did, they found um, 23 different pesticides flowing in the Puget Sound including the top four here, whoop, my little, my mouse is kind of crazy. The top four right here found in every body of water were all the products from um, the weed and feeds, from the, the lawn care and stuff like that. So one of my first messages is please, 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 everyone 
stop buying weed and feed products. They are, they are a, a menace to our environment. And like we're seeing, they just move so easily in water that these products are being found in 100% of everywhere we look for water and what's in them. You can't see the pesticides in there, but they're in there, 23 different pesticides. So all that's flowing down into our stormwater system. So now what we've done, is we have beautiful, life-sustaining water from the sky that running through our urban environment is now a problem for us. It's a problem of having beautiful water coming down from the sky to a point that um, the Department of Ecology estimates it's uh, 50 um, million pounds of uh, toxins each year flow into the Puget Sound. Um, and it's our number one uh, pollution problem is stormwater runoff, just water moving through our environment, big problem. The second condition we've kind of created because of our urban environment is drought conditions now. Because um, we're seeing where our, our, our environment is changing, you know, and it seems to be changing to some extremes. Um, where we saw in 2016, we saw higher than normal temperatures. April, May, July, August all had lower than normal precipitation, but higher temperatures. 2017, we broke more records. We actually set a record 55 days without rain. And then I don't know if anybody missed way back when, but when the rain did come, when they said, oh, you know, now rain is here and that 55 day record is broken. We actually just got enough to make the tin can wet. And then we had another 20 days after that with no rain. So it really was 75 days with no moisture out of the sky, which is really unbelievable for the, for the Pacific Northwest. And then in 2018, more records, May through August, the driest four months ever, setting more, uh, setting more records and stuff like that, of not having moisture come out of the sky. So now what we're seeing is our plants not having enough, to have too much moisture in winter, not enough in summer. And look at these arborvitaes right here. It actually got so hot that it fried the root system and that's why all the foliage is looking that way because that rock wall was south facing, got so hot that the plant, just could not take up moisture with those roots anymore. And then that rhododendron up there on the top, even though it's still green, even though it's still the leaves look okay, this plant is actually in horticultural terms, it's past wilting point, okay? That means that even though this plant looks like it's okay, it'll never come back. You cannot water this plant enough ever again because the roots are so damaged, it'll never be able to take moisture up from this plant. This plant will eventually die very soon from this, it's like that, but it's past its wilting point. If plants have little uh, moisture in the root systems, you know, most plants, especially the deciduous ones, you can kind of see their leaves just kind of fall down a little bit. As soon as the moisture comes in, they kind of get uh, more turgid and float up and stuff like that. Um, but when it's so bad that they are just collapsing on themselves, the plant's going to be compost. So we saw plants dying all over because they just did not have enough moisture. And then this bottom one here, look at that cracked soil. Um, because the soil was so dry, the, the clay soil was so dry, it's actually ripping itself apart, okay? And we have to realize that really our soils are like a big sponge, okay? And we allow them to get that dry, it becomes a difficult chore to rehydrate those soils so that waters can move through soils like they're supposed to. So if you have a dry sponge right out of the package, and you take a bunch of water and pour it right on top of that sponge, everything just shoots off, it just runs straight off because it's too dry, right? And too much water at one time. But if you take a little bit of that water and you just kind of coat the top of it, it actually softens up the top of it, allows those pores to open up a little bit. So now you can put more water in there to allow it to slowly seep through the whole sponge, where if you did it over time, you could take all that moisture and slowly be able to put it in the sponge and have it, none of that water come out of it because now it's being held in all those pores. And so our soil is the same way. If we let them get so dry, if we let them get so dry where they're like ripping themselves apart like that, it takes a long time for those soils to soften up on the top in order to be able to let the water start percolating through. And in 2015, um, where I took that picture of the soils that were broken up, we had some pretty good rains through 2016. Again, you know, record rains coming out of the skies during the winter time. But when we went out and did some aerations the next springtime on some of these lawns where the soil had allowed, been allowed to get so dry, even though they got all that rain during the winter time, when we were taking out plugs, it was only wet, maybe a half to an inch down into that soil, and then down below that completely dry. Even though we had like tremendous amount of moisture coming out, it was just so dry, it just shot straight off. So we never want to let our soils get that dry. We always want to have a little bit of moisture in there so that the water can always move through the soils, okay? 
So I'll talk about watering here a little bit later, but a big key of that is just never letting it get too dry. Just always have a little bit of moisture so that water, when it does come back through mother nature, the soils can do what they're meant to do, okay? And I even found um, in April when we had the shutdown for the virus and stuff, and so I was at home, we were setting a record before the end of April, we were setting a record for our most, one of our most driest Aprils yet. And I was watering my, my plants in April around here, which is like unheard of, but I was home every day. I saw how dry it was getting. I saw some of my areas where they, they um, over time always seemed to be drier. So I guess, so I was watering those areas just so they weren't gonna get too dry in April. So every landscape's different, every microclimate, every soil depth, every plant material, uh, uh, plant uh, canopies and stuff like that. We really have to be mindful when we're in our own places to um, just be watching our soils at all times, okay? So, and how Mother Nature, uh, kind of going to their tangent here, as Mother Nature does her thing, it's called soil building, right? And if we have a parent material, which we like, let's say it's that hard pan clay that a lot of us deal with, it takes a long time for organic matter to be built up over that soil surface so that it kind of starts crumbling down and making the soils better. And then over time it gets better and better. And then over time it gets better and better like over here. But a lot of this is based on plant material growing on top and then dying. And then organic matter being built up. So there's more plant material being built up there. So it dies. And so it's this succession of time um, and plant material, uh, different plant materials coming in in order to build soils. But it takes a long time to do it just by letting mother nature do her thing. In order to build this type of an organic matter layer before and beautiful topsoils, you wanna let mother nature do it, you're gonna take a long time. We wanna accelerate that and that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about now because compost is the key. And we have found that if we can just add a little bit of organic matter, a little bit of compost to our soils before planting, it's called amending, like if you can till it in before you do your plant material, um, these are the kind of results you get. The only difference between the plants on the left and the right is that compost was added to the soil before they were planted, and then they mulched around the plant material when it was growing to protect that soil surface and stuff like that. And look at the difference of those plants. The one control there on the left-hand side, it's like, yeah, we got some flowers off it. Even that little pepper plant is like, it's growing, you know? But look at the size of the plants on the right-hand side. These Now these uh, flowers are exploding out there. There's more of them. And those pepper plants are now flowering and have fruits and the, the, the tissue and the, the leaf material is phenomenal. That's what we want to create. And that is because we added organic matter beforehand and then covered up with mulch the soil surface so these plants can really explode. So that it can be this quick by adding organic matter to our landscapes to see these kind of results in a very short time. Okay. And the whole answer is compost. It's organic matter. It's life that's brought to the soil by this broken down um, process that compost is just like all those leaves and needles and fruits and whatever it is being broken down into this beautiful rich material that another now mother nature uses as like her gasoline to run the engine that we call the soil okay and really soil is based on this organic matter because if we look at just the basics of soils we have the sand silts and clays which is like our building blocks okay that's like our mineral components and stuff and then we start building beautiful soils by adding organic matter and that which makes loam in our soils. And that's really what we're looking for because this loam then makes the soils better by opening up and allowing for um, air spaces and for uh, areas for water to move down. And really in any good soil, in any quality soil, half of any part of that soil is just open air spaces. It's just spaces for water to percolate through, spaces for air to be able to move back and forth through, spaces for critters to be able to go down, roots to go down. That's what we're trying to create is these poor spaces and that comes from good soils and that comes from loamy soils. So we have to add organic matter to develop, develop a clay loam or a sandy loam or a silty loam, whatever soils we have, it's better with compost, okay? I never recommend it, and most people have clay soils and that's what uh, we deal with uh, probably 95% of the time is clay soils. I never recommend adding sand to clay to try to make the soil better. All we're doing is building concrete. It needs the organic matter for that pore space. It needs the light that's brought in there to be able to build good soils, not just two building blocks, okay? Because it's really, it's all the critters that are in there, right? It's the bacteria and the funguses, the protozoas, the nematodes, the arthropods. These are just the start of it. Even earthworms, like the larger ones that we can see, where Darwin even knew how important they were. We said worms in the intestines of the soil, all life, including ours, depends on their patient tilling. 
And so now when I'm in my garden, I actually, you know, I pick up an earthworm and I go, thank you, Mr. or Mrs. Earthworm. And I give him a big kiss <laughs> like this. And I go, thanks for everything you do. And then I'm looking at him, I go, am I kissing the head or am I kissing the other side? And so now, instead of kissing them, I just pick them up, pat them on what I think is the head and say, thank you for what all you do and put them back in the soil. But earthworms are a sign of good soils. And if you don't have a lot of earthworms, you'd be amazed. We're coming up to, um, I'll talk a little bit about this too with mulching, but the leaves are gonna start falling down out of the trees. Mother nature's annual renewal of organic matter. We're gonna see an explosion of it here pretty soon. If you have some areas of your yard with poor soils and stuff like that, lay down some leaves. Take like a 10 by 10 area and put down some leaves on it and, um, and then come back like a month or two later and pull back those leaves and you will find earthworms. They are there, they're ready to do their work. They just need to be given what they're looking for and leaves are a big part of it. So do a little experiment. If you're not sure about earthworm, put those leaves down, go back and check. You'll see the top of the soil is a little crumbler You'll see it's a little darker because the tannins from the leaves are starting to leach into the soil. So it makes it a little bit better over a short period of time and you'll probably find some earthworms. So it's amazing how we can accelerate what mother nature wants to do by just giving this organic matter renewal and the leaves are gonna come down and give it to you for free here pretty soon. So, but you gotta love the earthworms, okay? So maybe how about a, a quick pop quiz and Bill might have already talked to you about this, um, uh, but how many beneficial organisms can be found in a teaspoon? I got a teaspoon here. One little teaspoon, a little teaspoon of healthy soil. One little teaspoon. How many beneficial organisms? I'll start up with 4,000, anybody? I don't see hands, but I'll say 4,000, 40,000, 400,000, 400,000, 4 million, 400 million. Some people think it might be 400 million. Actually, none of those numbers, right? It's 4 billion. And I wish I had more of these brochures from King County they, that they put out. This phenomenal, phenomenal brochure talking about the 4 billion, 4 billion beneficial organisms in every teaspoon of healthy soil and how easy is to is easy to create that by just adding organic matter because that's the light that they bring to it and that's how your plants explode is by bringing this organic matter and these kind of organisms to your landscape okay so you gotta love compost you've got to love compost because again that's the broken down material that's the immediate injection of life into your soils now if you don't have compost, it shows like right on the left-hand side, leaves, man, put the leaves down, put the uh, arborist chips down, mulch the soils, and that's what I'll be talking to you about next, okay, is the easiest thing to do is to mulch. Mulching soils is how Mother Nature builds soils in her world. We just want to accelerate that through our own mulching practices, okay? So again, kind of already showed this, but parent material over here, takes a very long time for water to break it down, for a couple plants to grow up, to die, to add organic matter, for more plants, organic matter. What we want to do is boom, put that much organic matter on top and accelerate this soil building. And it's amazing how fast it happens just by adding organic material to the top of the soil surface like Mother Nature does it. This is how she does it and it's easy peasy. Everything that comes out of the sky, she just leaves on the ground to let those soils start doing their thing and stuff. As gardeners, we're very tidy. We always want to clean up. We always want to make things tidy and stuff like that. Big part of this is make it easy on yourself and leave the organic matter in your beds. Leave it till it's in springtime. Then you can come back and check it out and see what's going on. But you'll be amazed how much better the soils are by just leaving leaves. Leave your perennials in there. Leave all this organic matter. Spend the time in your hammock instead of out tidying everything up all the time, okay? Because the big challenge around here in the Pacific Northwest is bare soil, okay? And that's why Mother Nature in the Pacific Northwest always wants to cover the soil. If you don't cover your soil, she's gonna cover your soil with either plant material or moss or something like that to help protect the soils during our winter rains. That's her main job. Because if we have bare soil and rain starts hitting it, it detaches the beautiful fine stuff at the top of the soil and carries it all down. And that's where erosion comes in. And then we just have hard pan soils down below again. So we've got to protect the soil building that Mother Nature is doing by mulching on top of it so we never have bare soil, okay? So again, number one positive characteristic of soil building, I mean of mulching, is we're still soil building. We're doing what Mother Nature intended by just putting mulch down on top of our garden beds, okay? Uh, other positive characteristics is that it'll actually uh, reduce the evaporation uh, during our warmer summers. So that means you'll have to water less by having mulch down. It actually moderates the soil temperatures year round. 
So our temperatures in summer are cooler in the soils. Our temperatures in the soils are warmer during the winter time because it moderates instead of having extremes by having, uh, uh, having the soil uh, exposed to those type of temperatures and stuff like that. I heard Cisco Moore say a little while back that if someone has good mulch on their soil, if the ambient temperature is 90 degrees outside, the soil temperature will be 75. That's a huge difference for plants to feel, feel good about what they're doing and to be able to keep their processes going is that their root system is 75 degrees instead of 90 degrees. So huge difference by just having organic matter on top of the soil surface. And I kind of mentioned this again, but in the Pacific Northwest, mulches are the number one thing we can do to protect our soils from the harsh winter rains. And they're coming, they're gonna be here pretty soon. And they just start pounding everything. And when it's really coming down, it starts washing everything away. It protects our soils from those harsh winter rains, okay? Because they slow the water down. They allow that water to be slowed down, spread out and sink in instead of just rushing off. So huge advantages by just putting organic matter on top of our soils. Okay, so this is what we're trying to create. We are trying to create this layer right here that not only protects the soils, but is what allows for all the soil organisms down here to make better soils better and better and better and better over time. So it's easy to do. Put stuff on top, let Mother Nature do her thing. One of the easiest things we can do for garden practices is to mulch our yards. Okay, so mulch, 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 mulch. I spend at my time, and again, I'll show you some photos here. Other than when in the beginning when we were planting stuff like that, I've done my garden practice now just mulching. And I do a lot of my mulching in wintertime um, because the, the, the garden is slowed down. All the weeds aren't there, you know. I can put all my mulch down, put it nice and thick. I go out on a nice, cool fall or winter's day with a cup of hot cocoa. Just go out there and move some material around, work for a couple hours, go inside. It's like it's the easiest thing to do instead of trying to do all your mulching during the peak season when you got all these other things doing. So one of my keys for gardening is mulch during the wintertime to get all your mulch down. In springtime, you'll have little or no weeds coming up because of it. Because again, now this little weed here on the left-hand side, it's called shop weed. Um, everyone has it that I know that has bare soil, but you know what? I don't have any shop weed at my house because I don't have any bare soil. If I don't have a plant material growing on top of it, I have mulch growing there. But this little winter, winter annual is amazing as a plant that can get itself germinated, establishes this little rosette and it holds in all that soil around it with its root system even through the harsh winter rains and then it sends out this little flower this little white flower in early early um, spring or late winter put seed heads on it and then when we're out there gardening we hit it and it shoots the seeds into other places phenomenal little plant but the only reason people have this plant is because they have bare soil no bare soil no shot weed absolutely amazing so my number one thing about smart meeting is mulch. Use mulch. Use beautiful mulch to not only make our gardens better and look better, but make your weeding less. Okay. And a couple keys too about um, uh, mulching is that it's the it's a great physical control of weeds again because it doesn't allow seeds to germinate. As long as seeds are down below the ground and don't get sunshine, they will not germinate. Okay. But if we're out there doing our, our weeding and we go in our springtime and we do weed, weed, weed and pull all these weeds out of the ground, we are actually tilling the soil and bringing up new weed seeds to the soil surface. And then we come back like two or three weeks later, and we're going, oh my gosh, that whole place is full of weeds again. And the reason that it's full of weeds again is because we just tilled up new little weed seeds that you don't see, but they're there. So when I do my weeding, I immediately put mulch on top of it and I don't have any weeds. So you save yourself a ton of time by not re-weeding all the time after we do our initial weeding. So I got that um, right there. And there's a picture of it right there on the bottom. Hori Hori, man. H-O-R-I, H-O-R-I is the Hori Hori Japanese gardening tool. Phenomenal tool for making your gardening and your weeding easier because it's sharp, it's heavy duty. This is a sharp charade. It goes in there, it pops those weeds out. You need to make your weed work easier by having a good gardening tool like a hori hori so it's, it's less physical work. And then what I do, I have garden buckets situated all over my yard. And I'll show you pictures of my yard. You don't even see the buckets. I have them kind of just behind a fern or underneath a tree in the background, stuff like that. But whenever I'm in a garden, I see weed, I pull it and I throw it in the bucket. And then when I get back to it, I can go get the bucket and put it in there. But if I'm up there and I'm just kind of dinking around in my yard and I see some weeds and I don't take care of them, then they're going to flower and seed and take over and then you're going to have more work. So just have some garden buckets. And when you're out there, just pull them, throw it in the garden bucket. 
But if you go out like this little guy again here uh, with the um, shot weed, if you just pull a bunch of shot weeds and put them in a little pile right next to where you've been weeding, they will actually grow on top of each other, still flower and shoot weeds all over. So you need to contain them a little bit, make it easier, okay? But make your gardening a lot easier by mulching over the soil after weeding, mulching on a continuous basis. I do it on an annual basis every year, put more mulch on top of my soils to make less weed control and make my soil better, okay? So good tools, good tools to have, buckets for just, just regular garden buckets, put them around, throw your weeds in there, a fantastic physical tool like a, like a hori hori, and make gardening fun, make gardening fun, you know what I mean? So have a glass of wine, you know, have a beer or something like that. It's not, shouldn't be a chore, it should be something that's enjoyable, just being in our yard. And taking care of weeds are one things that we need to do in our yards but we got to make it simpler to make it uh, less work so that we can spend more time enjoying our gardens, okay? So good mulching, good garden tools, a couple garden buckets, mulch during the winter time, and you'll be amazed in springtime how much less work your yard will be, okay? And if you're going to do it right, you got to do it right, okay? So when, uh, when you're mulching, you don't want to bury your plants, okay? So if you're going to do it like a professional does it, um, you got to know that most of your time that you're going to be mulching is spent just distributing it around your plants, okay? It's not moving it from the pile into a garden bed. It's usually doing all the fine work to make sure that you're not burying the crowns of your plants, okay? So if you have like perennials or anything out there that you have a crown of your plant, you can't put mulch on top of it or it'll rot that plant off, okay? So what you need to do is what we call feathering, is that if you have your, your plant like this, you bring your mulch where it's just barely on your soil surface and then as it gets past the, so the, the plant's canopy, then it moves up because you need to have about three inches of mulch to be a good weed control, okay? You can't put a little skip of compost out there and go, oh, I did some mulching. All you've done is fed your weeds with the best organic fertilizer you can get. For weed control, three inches is a minimum, okay? And that can be a lot of material, but you don't, can't put three inches over the crowns of your plant. You feather it out from the crown and move it up so once it's past the canopy, then when there's bare soil or in between plants, then you have your three inches, okay? So it takes some work to do the feathering to make sure you're not around crowns, so you're not doing damage to your garden plants while you're doing this beneficial mulching to um, the soils. And this last one on the bottom one there, that in fall time, and, and usually if I give, I talk about this a little bit earlier, <clears throat> if the soils are really dry, you need to hydrate those soils before mulching on top of it, okay? So we had some really good rains here uh, last week or 10 days ago. Most soils are pretty well hydrated, but check your soils before you're gonna mulch. Make sure you have moisture in there. Because if it's dry soils and you put mulch on top of that, you'll actually create an interface where the water will not move through that mulch into the soils, okay? So we're creating an environment that when water hits the top, it just can perk straight down. That means you need to have moisture in your soil profile. You put your mulch on top of it. As soon as water goes down, it'll move down through your soil profile, okay? So, but to make sure the soil is always hydrated. And that's another reason I like to do mine in winter time because I know the soils are hydrated. And again, it's not so much work and time as I'd have to do it during the spring or fall season when there's a lot of stuff going on. So work your mulching around your other garden chores and you'll be uh, a lot happier, okay? So two of my favorite mulches that we have going on, first of all is arborist chips. And arborist chips are the material that when, they, when the arborist companies are either uh, limbing trees up or even taking trees down, they run through their big chipper shredders and shoot in the back of their trucks and it, it's this beautiful chipped material that around here because we have evergreens and usually when they're doing it year round they have like maples and stuff like that you will usually get greens and browns in the same mixture which is what compost piles are made of right you have your nitrogen you have your greens you have your carbon with your browns you mix them together compost happens that's how the magic happens and stuff so really by using arborist chips you're almost creating mini compost piles on top of your soil, plus creating a weed barrier because arborist chips are very easy to get three inches of, okay? So I love arborist chips, and I also love leaves. I kind of talked about it a little bit earlier. The leaves are gonna start fall, uh, falling from the trees. Keep them in our yards. Get them off of our lawns, because they'll kill the lawns if they get too thick on the lawn by suffocating them. But I recommend kick them in all your garden beds. Leave the leaves in all of our garden beds. Even if it looks kind of thick, that's how Mother Nature does it. She just protects her soils through this thick matter of just these leaves coming down. If you think they're gonna blow away or you wanna keep them a little more tidy, I recommend put a little bit of compost on top of the leaves after you break them off and that'll hold the leaves down. Once they get um, you know, a couple of rains, they'll kind of mat themselves down. 
but you'll be absolutely amazed in springtime how fast that big pile of leaves goes down to a very small thickness of leaves, but the soil underneath it is phenomenal already. You can create really nice soils in a short amount of time just by leaving leaves on the, on the soil profile. So love them. They're free. Use them up. Keep them in our yards. Don't pay to haul them up in yard waste. Now, well, one um, caveat. If you have plants that are diseased, like you have, let's say, fruit trees that have a lot of apple scab problems or mildews or something like that, those leaves should be removed and take, uh, put into the yard waste so they can be composted in a place that gets the temperatures really high to be able to kill those things. But any other leaf, leave in our yards, leave in our yards. If you think that it's too thick or too much, I recommend put them on your lawn, run your lawnmower over it, and then rake them all off back into your, into your beds and stuff like that so you'll have more material, but it's more broken up, easier to kind of work with and stuff like that. But leave them on there. You'll be amazed how easy it is to just rake leaves off of your beds, I mean off of your lawn, into the beds, and you're done. No raking into buckets, no raking into containers. Leave them in our yard. Less time, more time for you to hang out in the hammock, okay? So for Arbor's Chips too, they actually have this fantastic uh, organization now, getchipdrop.com, where they will give you free loads of Arbor's Chips. Because usually these Arbor's Chips, if they have, they don't have anywhere for them, they have to take them to the disposal place, and it's a phenomenal product to be able to use in our garden. So you get uh, this, you tell them where they're at, they will bring you a load for free, okay? Now you always ask for a clean load. That means no ivy, no holly, or blackberry. So tell them clean load, they know what you're talking about, they will not set you up with things that can be weedy if they can kind of get in there and take over. But most of the time they're gonna get this beautiful mixture of greens and browns and also a pretty good load. They might give you two yards, they might give you 15 yards. It's free, you're getting what's in the back of the truck. It's not like you're buying something where you can order exactly what you want. So you might have enough for your yard, you might have enough for yours and the neighbors and stuff like that. But if you get them for free, they're absolutely phenomenal to be use these in our yards. And I get a dump every, uh, probably here in November, and then I spend the next three months distributing them throughout my yard and all my guard beds, and I'll show you what happens in springtime here in a little bit. But take advantage of winter to mulch our yards. I love Arbor's Chips again because they, they stay thicker longer, okay? The leaves will break down over wintertime, and then the weed barrier becomes less. You use Arbor's Chips, they'll stick around through that big spring surge where weeds are trying to grow. They'll keep them all covered up. You have less weeding to do, and then I just renew it in the next winter with another layer of Arbor's Chips, okay? And the beauty, the beauty of Arbor's Chips is that it brings the fungal base to our soils, and that's really what we're looking, up, looking for. That's sustainable soils. Most soils start out bacterial. That's like the beginning of the soils, but in the end, as it gets better and better soils, it becomes fungal base. So you'll see like this in your yard when you're kind of tilling with your leaves or your arbor chips, where you roll a rock over and you see the fungi underneath it or fungi going over the leaves. Fantastic signs that you are bringing life and beauty back to your soils, which means your plants are gonna show that same thing. So it happens in a very uh, uh, quick time if we just leave that material there, okay? So you wanna do that. And some, for a lot of people, leaves, uh, and or Arbor's Chips might not be the, um, the look that they're looking for because it's just not as tidy, let's say. So that's when I recommend this composted black mulch, okay? I do not recommend the red barks anymore because they are just bark. They have not broken down. So they will actually take nitrogen from the soil in order to try to compost themselves because it's just straight carbon. So these composted bark mulches are the same type of material, but it's been composted. So now it's just breaking down and releasing all that beauty to the soils instead of like taking, um, um, uh, taking things from the soil to try to break down. So I always recommend these composted bark mulches. Most soil companies have them. Just ask for the composted bark mulch and you can get this really nice material that's beautiful, black, thick looking and stuff like that. Um, and it really kind of makes the plants shine too, you know. I like it a lot better than the red barks on just the plants really looking a lot better on it and stuff. So, so we have a lot of clients, they use this black bark in their front gardens where they might be a little showy or they just want to um, have a little more neater. And they're using arbor's chips and leaves in the back where that, that showiness is not so much of, of a thing, but they can still get the same benefits of adding uh, this constant renewal of organic matter to the soil surface, okay? So right plant, right place is the next subject. So again, you know, big key, if people just take care of our soils, mulching, we're getting into the fantastic mulching season. Take advantage of the season. You will see your plants explode if they're the right plant in the right place, okay? And really, again, like mother nature, if she's doing her thing, she has 
big plants up on top, smaller plants down below, a canopy down below, shrubs, and then ground covers. That's how her garden's built. And that's how we want to build our gardens too. Not just like one rhododendron sitting in the middle of the garden bed and stuff like that. Let's build canopies. Let's build layering that's going to slow that water down. But also like with this uh, uh, diagram shows, all the different animals that come in on different layers. So by building this layering, you're bringing in every different kind of bird into your yard instead of just one. So larger plants at the top, if we can get that, a lower canopy, shrubs down below, and then ground covers, ferns, and stuff like that uh, as our bottom layer to help not only uh, bring wildlife in, but all those layers slow the water down and protect the soil, okay? But trees probably have all the plants are the number one thing I want to talk about uh, because <clears throat> you can replace a perennial, you can dig up, like even a large rhododendron, you know, it's just a root mat, you can dig that up and move that around and stuff like that. Once a tree's in the ground and once it gets to a certain height, the only way that plant's going to come out of there is being cut down. And that's the worst thing we can do is have plants trying to get big and then we're trying to cut them down because they're in the wrong plant in the wrong place. But really trees are our environmental heroes, man. They stabilize the soils, they prevent erosion, they reduce stormwater runoff by allowing that water to slow down. They are shelter and food for wildlife. If it's done right at our homes, you can actually get heating and cooling benefits by keeping um, deciduous and evergreens on certain sites of the houses and stuff like that. Uh, so conifers will be on the north to block those winter winds. Deciduous trees on the south and west, so we get the shade during the summertime, but during the winter time, when those leaves are off the deciduous trees, you get the sunshine through those windows and stuff. So huge benefits by planting the right size plant in the right size place. But our biggest challenge is that we usually try to make trees small. We're trying to constantly, because trees want to get large and they're growing outside what they're, uh, what we think they should be and stuff. But look at this, I'm, I'm up in Lake Stevens and these trees here on the left, these are actually dug firs. These are dug fir trees that every year this guy shears into these conicals and then paints the trucks trunks white. A lot of work for no reason. For dug firs, a dug fir tree, why do that to a dug fir? Here, this tree over here, this is called pollarding. This is where a tree, uh, excuse me, this is where a person will come in who says they're a tree person, but they're really butchers. They'll come in, they'll whack down to stubs, you get all that sucker growth come up, and the next year they come in, whack down to the stubs, send up all that sucker growth. Worst thing you can do to trees, and it's just constantly making money for these people that are doing the wrong things to trees. And then this little cherry tree down here, look at the size of the trunk, and it's got a little teeny canopy. If anybody's ever gone to the UW during the spring uh, cherry um, trees doing their things in the quad there, or even like going to the Cherry Blossom Festival in Japan and stuff, mammoth sized trees with mammoth sized canopies and those petals coming down like snow all over it. That's how a cherry tree is supposed to look. Not supposed to be eight foot by five foot constrained, okay? So unless we put the right plant in the right place from the beginning, we're constantly trying to make them small and we're making more work for us or someone else that we have to pay to make those things small. So right plant, right place. We don't do this to any trees. We don't make them small little balls. We don't top them anymore and then let this go up. That's, they don't have, that's not a strong tree anymore. It won't have a good crotch anymore. Those trees will be weakened. They'll have problems. This is the worst thing to do on an evergreen is topping the top of it right here to make it smaller. This is the worst thing we can do to trees, okay? So right plant, right place at maturity and most times a tree wants to be good size you know what i mean i mean like some of these uh like let's say a blue spruce wants to be 150 feet tall by 80 feet wide unless you've got that kind of space in your landscape you can't plant it so you need to plant small landscape trees or maybe let like some shrubs like a rhododendron get larger and maybe grow into more of a tree-like form to take up that space so we're not trying to make them small but a couple of my favorite small landscape trees if we have the room and these are small landscape trees meaning they still get about 30 feet maybe 25 to 30 feet tall and maybe again about a 20 feet spread so we still need room for them but if we have this kind of room like this stewardia beautiful fall color you'll start seeing it right now like flaming red color on the stewardia but look at this bark over here just beautiful model bark when it's allowed to grow up to maturity not whacked down into a ball allowed to grow maturity Beautiful, beautiful tree, Stuardia, uh, Stuardia pseudo camellia. They call it pseudo camellia because the flowers that come out, little white flowers, look like camellia flowers. Beautiful flowers in springtime. And then these little nuts in fall time. Great look for the tree for a landscape. 
And then the Styrax, uh, the Japanese snowball. Look at these guys. Again, 25 feet or so for, you know, for a, for a height and a spread. And that's for their maturity. That's what they pop out at. So you never have to prune them again, except for dead wooding or thinning or something like that. But look at this in springtime. Absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous flowers. Just uh, when I have one in my front yard, and I'll show you here in the pictures, um, the bees are all over this. I walk out the front door and it's like you can hear the humming in springtime. And it smells like this honeysuckle smell. Beautiful, beautiful little trees. And then my all-time favorites are the Japanese maples, the Acer palmatums. When they're allowed to grow like this, when they're allowed to have a canopy and you can see the structure, you can see the branching and stuff like that, that's a beautiful tree. Not a little cousin it and not a tree that's, uh, that's a bigger one that cut down to be a small tree. Done right with these fall colors and stuff like that. Some of the best small landscape trees that we can have is the Acer palmatums. And if anyone's thinking about buying uh, uh, some Japanese maples for their landscapes this fall, go out and check them when they're fall color because this is the best time you'll really get the colors you're looking for because even though the trees might be the same types, every plant's an individual and some might have really phenomenal color, some might have marginal color. So go in and picking up the trees right now for your Japanese maples, you'll get the colors that you're really looking for, okay? And then if anybody ever wants to prune on trees, again, we're not making them small, we're just trying to help them with their structure thinning, taking out diseased or dead wood or something like that. Uh, Cass Turnbull's uh, organization, Plant Amnesty, is a phenomenal organization, plantamnesty.org, um, about just good pruning habits. So they're committed to stopping the mutilation and torture of trees and shrubs by trying to make everything balls, short, and uh, squatty and stuff like that. You need to know what kind of plant it is and how it grows, and then pruning for habit. And then a lot of that is letting plants grow up. And if it's the wrong plant in the wrong place, Remove it, get another plant that's gonna, when it's at its height, take up the space you're looking for. You're gonna save yourself so much time and money on just having to make things small all the time. No, 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 let them grow, let them do their thing, and then we're not spending all that time trying to maintain them at a certain height, okay? And then another quickie about planting natives, because natives are very popular, but we are finding that they're a challenge in our urban landscapes because they don't have really good soils, okay? So these two trees, these two plants here, um, are really successful in the uh, forest environment, but they seem to do really good in our urban landscapes, even in poor soils. So on the left there is the sword fern. I love sword ferns. I put sword ferns everywhere in my landscape. If I don't know what I'm gonna do with the spot, I put a sword fern in there. It's evergreen, it protects the soil year round. And then when I decide what I wanna do in that spot, dig it up and move it somewhere else and stuff. But I love sword ferns, any kind of fern, any kind of an evergreen that grows in our gardens um, for the winter time, is uh, the slower, it allows that water to slow down even during the winter times. And then I love these vine maples on the left-hand side here. Um, I've got them all over my yard. I've got big ones, uh, single trunk, multi-trunk. I mean, they have different shapes and sizes. They have all these different leaf colors. Um, and a beauty about vine maples too is that they have a very inconspicuous flower uh, that pops out in um, um, middle springtime. So yeah, you really want, most people notice the flowering on a maple tree, but these very small flowers come out, but they're actually the flowers that are the number one food source for the hummingbirds that are traveling from Mexico, migrating up to Canada. And when they get up to Washington and they are almost to Canada, but they are pooped, those little flowers are their number one food source. So I put vine maples in my yard and in springtime, I have hummingbirds all over my yard because they're coming for these flowers. So throw in some vine maples, a couple of sword ferns around the bottom of it. You have a phenomenal beginning of a nice little native garden that has color, vegetation on it and attracts wildlife. Two of my favorites right there, okay? And then ground covers. I'm not gonna talk about a lot of ground covers, but here's one of my favorites is epimedium. I have this in a couple spots, really nice plant bronze green foliage. I whack it down in February, clean it all out, and it sends out all these flowers like you see here. Some of them are white, some are yellow, depending on kind of a variety of epimedium you plant and stuff. And then all this new foliage comes up and then takes over that area. But it gets very tall. It's probably 18 to 24 inches. And that's what I like for ground covers. I don't like ground covers that are very small right around the, gut, the, the soil surface because weeds get in there very easily. I want plant material to grow thick I want plant material to grow tall, which means that's my number one weed barrier is plant material out competing the weeds, and then any bare soil has mulch on top of it, 
and I have little or no weeding to do because of this in my yard, okay? So let me talk about smart watering, then I'll show you a couple pictures of my place here. Um, but smart watering really is a big key for us too because we're starting to find again that during our summer times, um, we're having less water come out of the sky, which means we do need to supplement our plant material in order for our plant materials to be successful and to thrive. We want our plants to provide, I mean, to thrive, not just survive, okay? And for all of us, and I'm not sure, um, maybe uh, one of the questions could be like, you know, where uh, um, you guys get your water from down there, but like up here in the Seattle area, you know, we get it from a couple watersheds that every year have to be replenished through our snow and our, through our rain, and then it fills it back up, and then we use it, and then it fills it back up. So we have to be very conscientious because we're getting more and more people, more and more development, more and more uh, areas sprawled out, but doesn't mean we're going to get more water coming out of the sky. So we really have to be consistent on trying to be good water stewards when we're using our water because we're going to have to use water to have successful landscapes. But a couple things that we can do in order to make it better for our water in the landscape is again, number one thing there on the top, building better soil with compost and mulch. Kind of talked about it a little bit, but uh, you gotta constantly have to harp on it. We're really, that is a key for any good landscape is compost, mulch, renewal of organic matter, having really good soils get better and better and better, which makes better use of water in those landscapes. And then group plants according to water needs. You can't put like a water loving plant next to a plant that doesn't like to have water or one of those is not going to be successful and have problems. So do a little research and plant plants according to what their water needs in into areas so you can take care of them um, accordingly. And then lawns are a big water user. Uh, grass plants when they're done right is a really good plant for our landscapes for our you know our, uh, be able to go out there and play with your kids and have areas for our pets and stuff like that but they use a lot of water so we really have to be mindful of how much area we have in lawn and whether it's useful and if it's not turn it more into garden beds or food or something like that so we're just not putting water out on lawns okay and again if we're in charge of putting water out into a landscape we've got to be responsible about it i mean to do something like this where we're taking beautiful pristine water that's been given to us through our, our uh, water services and they don't give us water through our pipes and say hey here's some crummy water you can use for just flushing toilets and here's some nice water that you can use for whatever else you want it's all beautiful water they give to us we've got to be really responsible for how we're using it and this is not being responsible just let it roll down into the gutter okay use it correctly so you get the maximum benefit of it and we're not wasting this precious resource so that means for us we really need to know how much water is coming out of our system and every system's different every sprinkler system's different and that's why we have to measure it and the number we're going for is one inch that we're asking people to um uh, to try to measure for and so you can go out matter of fact i don't have mine here but i got some tin cups you know cat food cans tuna fish cans you know whatever you can use any kind of containers like this just go out let the water whatever sprinkler you have water for a certain amount of time pick you know 15 minutes half hour whatever it is and then go out and measure those those containers to get an idea of like a, a um, an average of how much water came out of all those containers. So let's say you water for a half hour and you get a half inch, you'd know you'd have to water an hour to get one inch. Okay, so some basic calculations. And my sprinkler is like that one up on the uh, the top there, an oscillator. So it goes, you know, it goes back and forth. And I really like an oscillator sprinkler because as it goes from one side it waters. When it goes to the other side, it allows that water to sink in on the other side. So when the water comes back, it allows it to sink in a lot more. Sometimes water gets put on way too fast and the soils can't handle it. And then that water just gets run off. Okay, so I like slow watering. An oscillator does that. At my house, it took me three hours to get one inch of water with my oscillator. So a long time to get one out, uh, to get one inch. But every landscape is different. Water pressures are different. Soils are different. Plant material different. Everyone needs to do their own instead of just saying, tell me how much to water because it's just, it's tough to just give an answer, okay? And again, water, you know, it's kind of amazing how much water can be used over uh, like this one acre if you're gonna put down one inch of water, it's 27,000 gallons of water. So we have to be mindful of it. We just don't wanna just water to water. We don't wanna just not water because we're trying to be conservatives. Like there's this balance in there to make sure that we're doing what we need to to get the maximum results with the amount of water we're, that we're using. And that's why really for us, uh, even the Pacific Northwest um, 
uh, for sure, is that we need to adjust our watering depending on the seasonality. Like I said, in April, I had to water my yard this year, where past Aprils, I haven't had to water my yard. Every year's different, all plant materials are different. But people who have like um, irrigation systems, they just set the timer and it just waters the same amount uh, for the whole entire summer. It's usually overwatering, wasting water, which means they're paying money for something that they're not getting the benefits of. So we usually have a little bit less in springtime, a little bit more in summer, and then it comes back down in fall time. And then we need to uh, turn them off when we don't need it. And that's coming up here pretty soon, you know, probably about another week or two when we see the rains come in, most people need to be turning their irrigation systems off and not just let them uh, run until someone can uh, shut them down for the winter, okay? And the benefits, if we can, if we can take water and water it in when the soils are a little bit dry and allow that water to percolate all the way down into our soil surface, if we have, let's say, six inches of good soil, that one inch of water will actually fill up that entire six inches of, of soil profile. And then the beauty, if we do it right, is that as the top half dries out a little bit, roots will go down finding that water and you can train your root system to go deeper into the soil, which means you have a better root system. And this kind of shows this little graph shows the same way. If you water a little bit every day, the roots don't have to grow down very much because the water is always there. But if we allow that soil system to fill up and then just water maybe one inch a week, the water will, the roots will go down finding that water. Now, roots will not go down into dry soil hoping to find water. The water has to be there and the roots will go down there looking for it, okay? And that's the beauty. And then look at what we can create. Here's a lawn that we did for a client where they had really nice root depth. And these roots right here are nine inches deep, nine inches deep of a root system. And look at this lawn, thick and tenacious. That's what we're looking for in plant material. Where look at this soil here. It's like, it's clay. It is hard pan clay, hardly any top. So I don't even see any here, but yet the plant is still able to survive, okay? It's not doing well, but the lawn is still able to survive. The key for any plant is again, not just surviving. We don't want it, we're just eking a life, but we want plants to thrive. We want plants to explode. That's what we're looking for in our gardens because it makes our gardening easier when our plants are this happy, okay? So again, in most of our, urban environments, you know, and I, if you live in a development, let's say, most of your roots are probably going to be at that soil surface because you don't have good soil down below until you start building it. So in these areas, we might have to water a little more often for a little less time because you can't fill up one inch into like a half inch of soil. So again, every landscape's different, every plant material is different. You kind of have to figure it out for yourself on how deep your soil is. After you water, go in and check to see how that is. And the easiest thing to do that with is a soil probe. I love these guys, love them, love them, love them. Um, or up in Snohomish, uh, up in the downtown Snohomish, in the city of Snohomish is Stuber's Horticultural Supply. And they have these really heavy duty ones. This one is um, a Hoffer soil sampler. You can get them online. It's a good piece of material, probably costs about $75, but it's, it's worth its weight in gold for discovering what you're doing down below in the soil and the roots. After I water, I go and I stick this in the soil and I can see exactly how deep my roots are. I can see exactly how far my water went down there. All these things, how good my soil is and how much it's getting better. So you can do very invasive um, checking of your soil and your watering by just getting yourself a soil probe. Really easy to do, but without knowing what's going on down below, very difficult to kind of figure out what's going uh, up on top and stuff. So I highly recommend as any good horticulturist a soil probe. And I just carry mine in my little tool bucket when I'm going around with my pruners and stuff like that, just checking soil after watering, checking soil. My plants don't look good, I put it in the soil. What's going on down below? How are my roots doing? Soil probes are phenomenal tools for that, okay? And then the best time to water, um, and this is a, the uh, uh, really basics of trying to get enough water down into our soil surface before it starts warming up and we have that water starting to evaporate out or being used by uh, the plants through evapotranspiration, right? So the whole key is trying to do it when things are cooler and when it's not as, the air is not moving as much. And so that in the Pacific Northwest, that's usually morning times for us. If you can water in the mornings, it's the number one thing to do because you can get that moisture down in there. Then when things start warming up, the plant material has all that ample water to be able to do its function stuff. But if you can't water in the mornings, early evenings is fine too, once things like if there's no breeze going on, because 
breezes will definitely evaporate that water out quicker before you even can get into the soil. So if you have a non-breezy evening, you can do that, but I don't recommend all the time early evening and stuff. You don't want things to be wet during the nighttime all the time. So that's why I love mornings, but if you have to, early evenings, do it, man. Just get the water out there. And then even cloudy days are okay where we just don't have that intensity of the sun to evaporate and stuff like that. But mornings, early evenings, cloudy days, and just the best time again is when you can get out there to water to be able to get the maximum penetration before the plant material needs it, okay? So I'm gonna finish off here by showing you some pictures of my house. Um, I live up in Lake Stevens and uh, when we first moved into this place, it had been a rental, it had been beat up. This is actually the front uh, slope. I'm not gonna call it a lawn because it was mostly just, it's weeds. It was almost 100% weeds. When we uh, uh, moved into the house, nobody had taken care of it for like two or three months. The weeds were actually like two and a half feet tall. So I mowed them all down um, just to kind of get to a basic plant material. And then I took it all up. I used a sod cutter. That's a machine you see up there at the top. It actually just has this cutting blade that goes right underneath all that root material so I can roll it up and get rid of it easily. But you can see all the soil there is just hard pan clay. I mean, there's there's no good topsoil there. Nothing was brought back in. They just put, you know, plant material on top of this cleachy clay and then the weeds took over because all those types of plants like dandelions and clovers are meant to make poor soils better. That's because they're tough plants. So that's what was entirely growing there. I wanted to build uh, gardens. So I removed all that. I brought in beautiful, I think it was 60 yards of uh, composted uh, topsoil, amended it all in with that heavy clay. So I really had a nice root depth of decent soils now as a start, but you can see it's a nice dark color. I put my dry river stream in there where I actually hooked my um, uh, rain gutters too. So now it becomes like a rain garden where the water just kind of collects inside there and starts to pour into the stormwater system. And then I built an arbor back there for a, um, a wisteria, which I really love wisterias. And then I just started planting around it. So planting, planting, planting. The whole key for me in my landscape is almost no spare soils and plant material that I want taking up that those areas. And so here's more. I just thicken it up with as many plants as I can um, so that I don't have bare soils going on and these different starting to build plant layering and canopies going on. Here's the wisteria growing on that arbor. Like this is probably about five years later. You can see I got a vine maple here up in the corner with an azalea underneath that and then flowers underneath that. So I'm developing layers now in my landscape by putting the plants as they get larger in these areas. Um, and then in the beginning, because I had some bare soil, I would just throw out seeds. I love columbine seeds. I love cosmos seeds. I think that's my next one. I love cosmos. I just threw out seeds everywhere to get more plant material growing in there to give me seasonal color and stuff while my small plants started getting bigger before they would start flowering and stuff like that. But I wanted color. I wanted to take up room as much as possible with just plants growing all over. I also, I love rocks. I brought in a bunch of big rocks. You saw them with the dry river stream. Rocks for me are fantastic in that once you put them there, you never have to garden that spot again. It adds some interest, but I never weed that area. I never water that area. They're fantastic for just taking up space. And in my landscape company, we actually will give a lifetime guarantee on any rock that we put in a landscape for our clients. If that rock dies on them, we will come out and replace it immediately. And because we plant them well, I've never had to go out and replace the rock they've all lived. Okay, so here's going into my backyard. You can see vine maple here, vine maple here, vine maple up here, vine maples along the fence here, sword ferns, sword ferns, sword ferns, hosses. I'm just packing it in with vine maples and sword ferns. Easiest plants to take care of, and they give me a nice little woodland effect and to start my canopies and stuff like that. And plus the, the springtime with the hummingbirds is phenomenal. So I, brought, I just keep on packing it in, more and more ferns, more and more plant material. Even back here, I built like a little water feature just to give uh, water, uh, the sound of having water in the landscape, but also um, uh, uh, insects and birds just like that need water too. So it's a water source for them. Here's one of my favorite uh, um, uh, maple trees, Japanese maple. I have it coming over my wall. Now it's even larger where it just has this nice canopy and flowing coming down over the dry, or over the, uh, the pond and stuff like that. Really nice look and beautiful, beautiful fall colors. And here's one of my garden beds in the back. So it's huge. I mean, I do not have anything small in here and I just pack it in with more plants. 
There's some weeds in here, but you can't see them. I have anemones, I have a hydrangea here, peanut butter bush, a honeysuckle bush back here. I just pack it in with plants and let them grow up and take all that space. You can see there might be just a little bit of space in here we hadn't covered up yet with plant material and I have a pack full of mulch. So wherever I don't have uh, plants, I have bare soils, I have mulch down in all these beds and then let them grow. I don't take care of these things. I come in springtime, clean it up a little bit, take all the dead flowers off the hydrangea, let it go for another season. But I'm not having to tend it all the time by trying to keep things smaller or separated. Let them grow together, pack it in. And then back to my favorite spot. This was all like all beat up lawn in the backyard, but we built a deck. I got my hammock underneath it, then all these little woodland plants down there and mulch and stuff like that that just give me a nice feel. So I just hang out in my backyard, feel the breeze on it, listen to the birds and the, the, the bees and stuff like that, and then uh, enjoy my landscape. And that's what I'm hoping that you folks will be able to do uh, through these tips I gave you tonight, to have a nice natural landscape, okay? So, got some resources here, Natural uh, Lawn and Heart Garden Hotline, Plant Amnesty, uh, Get Chip Drop, and then um, these fine people that have been putting this on also are a fantastic resource too. Uh, I will now pass it back over to Walt or Rachel, and I think we probably have some questions um, from the attendees tonight. We do. We have a couple of questions, so we will start with uh, Margaret. She would like to know, uh, do you find that slugs or snails become problematic with winter mulching with leaves? I have found that I don't have that problems with slugs and snails when I use arborist chips. I don't think they like all the little uh, little sharpness and the little chunks and stuff like that. Um, and me, slugs are only a problem in early spring when the plants are just starting to come up. Like let's say hostas sometimes can be, you know, a slug haven and stuff like that. So what I do is if I have any of those types of plants, I use a sluggo or worry-free slug bait. So it's not a stomach poison. It's just a uh, a phosphorus and iron product that slugs eat and then they just go away and die and stuff like that because they just don't want to eat anymore. Um, so any areas that I find that might be susceptible to slugs, I use the slug go, but what I found is once the plants get to a certain height, they just explode and there might be a couple slugs on them, but they're not a problem. So uh, I don't think that uh, slugs or snails should be a deterrent for not using leaves because the benefits will way outweigh the um, uh, having a couple slugs around that you have to use either the slug o on or um, just picking them off by hand. Awesome. Uh, next question, and this is a question that I would like to know the answer to too. Um, does it help to lay cardboard down before piling on the mulch? And great. I'm glad you thought of that, Rachel, and I can <laughs> almost read your mind about it and whoever else had that question. We have found that cardboard's really nice if there's a lot of weeds in that area that you don't want to deal with, um, or you have some pretty bad uh, bare soil, we make sure that soil is hydrated, you put cardboard on top of it, and then you put your mulch on top of it. It makes an even stronger weed barrier because physically plants can't grow through that cardboard, but yet it'll like in a year's time, it'll break down so that you still get water movement, still getting air movement and stuff like that. So um, I love using cardboard. Um, especially like if I'm taking over garden beds that were lawn or had a lot of weeds, especially grasses, can be really tenacious to try to dig out. Cut them down as low as you can get them, where you beat up that plant material. So now it's under stress and also having to try to use reserves from its root system to try to grow again. But if you can cut all that down and then slap that cardboard on top of it and the mulch, all those weeds down below will just die and turn into organic matter because they don't have the reserves to be able to break through that cardboard and that mulch to be able to get the sunshine. So I love using cardboard when it's in tougher to areas to, uh, to, um, to weed. But I found it difficult to use it like in my perennial beds because we have all your plant material together. You just don't have enough room to put cardboard down. So I just put thicker mulches in those areas in between the um, crowns of my perennials. Good to know. I spent a lot of time putting cardboard in my beds. This and it's good. I mean, I, you know, get for weed barrier and stuff like that. And, uh, and I also, um, when I was doing my house, I went and got a cardboard from like a home appliance place. It's like a refrigerator box takes up a huge amount of space compared to like, you know, trying to cut up cardboard boxes and then put them down and stuff like that. So if you have larger areas to so like, they, they're, they just had it in the recycling, they're giving away for free 
I was getting a lot of refrigerator, washer dryer boxes, took up big space, laid them down, mulch on top of it. A couple hours later, my gardening's done. Awesome. All right, next question is from Pat. Any ideas for a seasonal ditch along the front street? Most, mostly gravel and weeds now, seeing lots of shot weed already this fall. Yep, next question. <laughs> um, you know what, those, those um, areas are very difficult because you can't use any products right next to a water source like that. I mean, that's, we know that's directly going into it and stuff. But again, anything that's kind of grown down like gravel or anything like gravel really is a phenomenal um, seed growing area and stuff like that, because it drains off a little bit stuff. So um, very difficult in those areas with, without it just being like a weed eater that you're using. Now for shot weed in those areas, you probably could use a torch, um, which is just like a propane tank. And they sell them, it's called yard or weed dragons, I think, stuff like that, has a little, hose on it, has a gun with a, a flamer on it. Once we get into our wetter, colder months, you can use that torch out there in all those kind of areas to just like explode all that tissue and stuff. Um, doesn't leave any, you know, does, it's not a poison or a toxin or anything, but those are pretty successful in gravel areas during the winter time when things are really wet where you know you can't start a fire by using one of those. But other than just weed eating in the summer and then a torch in the winter time, very difficult. Um, area to try to do naturally if we're just trying to maintain it so that water can move through it. it just becomes a maintenance issue. All right, thank you. So Alan has a question. Should I remove the leaves in the spring or leave them on the flower beds? I say leave them, leave them, leave them. Um, uh, every bed I've worked in, even if the leaves are on there pretty thick in fall time, they really kind of, you know, flatten themselves out and disintegrate during the winter. And then those plants are strong enough to be able to break through that hostas, daylilies, bulbs, anything like that. They are built to kind of move through um, uh, forced litter that way to get up and start doing their thing. So I say leave them on. Uh, don't do any more work on them. Great. All right. Richard asks, how can I best live with squirrels that are eating plants? Do you have a list of squirrel proof plants? Squirrel proof plants? Um, I do not, but I recommend Russell Link's book, uh, Living with Wildlife in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so Russell Link, he talks about squirrels, he talks about um, rabbits, he talks about moles, he talks about deer, all the furry creatures um, that can be troublesome. He gives great recommendations for plants that they do and don't like and like natural uh, physical barriers that they don't like and stuff like that. So I would probably look at Russell Link's book uh, to get some good recommendations on squirrels. Great. Um, any suggestion for horsetail control? Well, horsetail. So uh, Ann Lovejoy, who's a really good garden writer, he, she's phenomenal, Pacific Northwest. She actually says that horsetail is an indicator plant in your garden. It indicates that you need to move. Okay. <laughs> okay. Other than that, though, if you want to try to, I should say that it's very difficult to control horsetail. Um, a couple options, though is that uh, Cisco Morris at the Seattle University where they had a huge bank of horsetail, he grew some geraniums with the horsetail. The geraniums grow faster than the horsetail and get up and they have all that foliage and all those flowers and stuff. And then when they started fading and the horsetail would start popping through, he cuts it to the ground and then the geraniums pop up again. So it's kind of masking the horsetail by having this beautiful little flower, pink flower out there with the geraniums and all their foliage. So they just kind of say, complement each other a little bit so it's a masking situation. Um, I had horsetail come in with a, um, a pine tree at my house that I was showing some of the pictures of there. So I planted it. About a month later I started seeing horsetail popping up around the root ball. So it came with the root ball but they had cut it down so you couldn't tell if there was horsetail in this root ball. 
So Anne Lovejoy also recommends that if you can, if it's in a small, you know, in a spot that's kind of controllable, we'll say that the best way to deal with horsetail is to cut it. So I had a pair of scissors that I had in a plastic Ziploc baggie that I kept by this pine tree and by the horsetail. And every time the horsetail would pop up, I would cut it, okay? Because if you're pulling horsetail, the plant thinks it's being under attack, and so its root system goes into supercharge and it sends up heads everywhere in order to recover from this being attacked and stuff. But if it's being cut, it, it, the plant thinks it's being grazed upon like you know Mother Nature would do. If like a, an animal comes in there and just chews a little bit of the top and just moves on and stuff. So it's okay being grazed a little bit. It just doesn't want to be pulled up like it's trying to be removed. So I would cut the horsetail every time, every time I saw a head come up, I would cut the horsetail and eventually the energy in its root system died off and the plant couldn't put up more uh, heads. So every time I would cut it, it'd have to use energy from its root system to try to get it out to start photosynthesizing. I would cut it, have to use energy to start photosynthesizing. But the challenge is that if you let that head get up there and start growing, it's photosynthesizing and taking energy into its root system that whole time. So it becomes to more tenacious and more tenacious. So you have to be really consistent. You have to be very um, diligent about it. And that's why I had the scissors in the baggie next to it. As soon as I saw the horsetail, I had to cut it. I couldn't say, oh, I got to get my pruners and I'll get that next week. Because by the time I got there next week, it would be this tall and then it's going to be even tougher to get rid of. So long story, short answer that if you can either mask it or you can try to just slowly get rid of it. And in a probably a two by two area, it took me about a year to keep on cutting before that horsetail was not there anymore, but it took a lot of time. Um, very, very difficult plant to deal with if you want to get rid of it. Uh, sometimes it just becomes a uh, part of our landscape to just live with it, put in some more ferns and stuff like that. And it just becomes part of it instead of trying to kill it all the time because most people are never going to be able to kill it with chemicals. All right. So next question is, it's fascinating. <laughs> um, next question is from another Rachel. Um, I'd love to cover my septic slash leach field with something other than grass. What to plant? You know what I would do is with that one is that I would contact your local, like the Tacoma uh, Health Department. They probably have like septic care things that they talk to people about it because septic systems are also can be damaging to the environment if they're not working right and such. Most people plant grass on top of it because it's an easy care plant and its root system only goes down so far. You know, they will not recommend you put like trees or some shrubs in there that they can get some really deep root systems and then start destroying the septic fields. So that's why grass or grass type plants have been most popular for growing on top of that. Um, so that's why I would ask Tacoma if they have any other plants that they recommend that you can put on top of that that is not going to damage your septic uh, drain field long term and cause big problems. Um, so I don't have a quick and easy answer, but I think that they would probably be the best to get a hold of. All right. Uh, we just graded our backyard and it is all clay. How much top, so top soil should I put over it? to start a low maintenance garden? If you can, if you can add about four inches of composted topsoil, so not just compost, you wanna do composted topsoil, um, and amend that into your existing soil to a depth of probably six or seven inches, you're gonna be well on your way. So that, that composted topsoil will help break up that clay and then give you a better um, root zone to start growing into and stuff. But, you can put three or four inches before you start amending in there. You should get a, a really good start on your gardening beds. All right, we just have a couple more questions. Um, one is that um, the on the slide, the hotline number is missing a digit. Um, so oh. is then I would go to the help at garden hotlines <laughs> or just go 00221. If that doesn't work, go 0222. And I hope it's the last number I'm missing. <laughs> <laughs> but I would, just, I would just go to the help at garden hotline.org and uh, just tell them that some guy didn't have, couldn't figure out a phone number in this day and age. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, while uh, you are answering the next question, I will go see if I can find that number and I'll post it in the chat. Okay, thank you. Um, so next question is from Nick. How do you know when a dry river is appropriate for your yard? I think in most yards, if you have some slope, so you have some contours, you can have some nice movement with it. Almost every landscape can use a you know, dry river stream or even incorporate it where you can get water from your downspout to go into that to start forming a, uh, a rain garden. Very popular nowadays is started putting rain gardens in so that water from our downspouts and stuff can be centered into those areas. But uh, for me, I like having some contour in the landscape before I put in a dry river stream or anything that looks like water's moving because I don't think it looks natural where we have it flat and then we just build up a bunch of rocks on one end and then have water coming into it or a flow like that. It just doesn't look like mother nature built it. So that's one reason I was very attracted to that house that I just showed you is because the front was nice and sloped. The back had some nice contours. I could really easily start building garden beds and having some nice movement in there without having to bring in a lot of soil to start building that up. So um, if you've got the movement and you have the flow, dry river streams or, or rain gardens are phenomenal for almost every landscape. Awesome. We have one last question um, and it is, I had a wisteria plant that got out of control. How did you train the wisteria on your arbor? I talk really nice to it. I found that if you're mean to them, then they don't like it. Um, so wisteria, as a matter of fact, the one reason I grew it on an arbor is because if people grow it on houses and stuff like that, it can destroy things. I mean, it is a tenacious plant. So what I do um, every year, I do it twice a year, is I cut off all the new growth coming up to it, back to the main canes. And then in wintertime, when all the leaves are off of it, when I do my next pruning, I prune all those suckers off of it and I prune down to just all the flute, the, the flowering um, spurs. And it's, you can kind of tell the difference between that, a vegetative a bud and a flowering bud that once you kind of um, look at the plant. And so I'll cut all those off so that uh, the next spring, all I get is all the flowers coming down and have, that's my look. And then it sends off all that new growth, kind of covers everything up and then I prune it down again and stuff. But um, uh, plant amnesties, uh, website uh, uh, right there, plantamc.org. Um, they have a chapter on wisterias and how to do it right, show you nice drawings of what a vegetative bud and a flowering bud looks like. But really, if you're into pruning, uh, wisterias, you can beat them up really well and they'll constantly be growing and put out new growth and stuff like that. So um, a great plant to have if you know how to prune it and keep it under semi-control. I love them. But I go to Plant Amnesty, they'll give you some great advice and uh, the pictures to really show you where you need to cut. Great. Well, that was our last question. And I posted the hotline number in the chat. That last number is in fact a four. So oh, you wouldn't well, have had to try that many times to get it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I was almost there. I was at two. <laughs> Yeah, All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to pass it back to Walt. Okay. I, I would like to uh, thank Lad. Thank you so much for a great talk. You uh, get me excited for the spring. I was thinking all of these things I want to do, get the mulch down and everything this, this winter, of course. And, uh, it's all that, for you, Walt. And, yeah. So thank you. And then I'd also like to thank uh, Todd Smith and, and Bree Ellis, Todd from University Place and Bree from City of Harbor. And remind everyone that the webinars, the three webinars that we've offered in this series, all of them are being recorded or were recorded and will be posted on the city's website, City of Gig Harbor, City University Place, and uh, also the uh, Tacoma Pierce County Health Department website. So uh, look for them there in case you didn't get, or if you wanna see them again, or if you have friends that wanna watch. And then uh, look for us next year. Uh, we usually offer these in the spring. We usually offer them in person, but um, who knows what next spring might bring. We might be doing them again as a, a uh, webinar too. So uh, happy gardening and have a great, great winter, everybody. So. Thanks everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.